everybody, this is Perch. I've done these videos on uh, adoption rates and how groups tend to hook onto things and you get early adopters, you got to cross the chasm, chasm, get to the normies and, and so on. Um, but by the way, if you ever meet me in person, I've asked a bunch of people this, uh, my voice is not as high or I, I don't know, it's deeper than it sounds on uh, uh, through this video. I, I, I don't know why. But uh, every time, that's why I hate listening to myself. Every case, I went back and I was looking at some stuff with the uh, that, that analysis video, and it just painful. I hate it. Anyway, uh, if you're going to cross a chasm, most people, if you're in business school and they're talking through this, will tell you you need a good plan to survive while you're crossing the chasm. Because crossing the chasm means you're you know you're going from one place to an uncertain second place, and that uncertainty, that step can be very, very tough to, to pull off. It can be hard to, to manage. It can be hard to survive. And, and for, if you're a small company, if you're a startup, and you're going to get investment, you're going to go get somebody to invest in your company and fund it, many companies will tell you, you know, where's your product plan? What's your, your go-to-market strategy? And do you have enough funding to cross the chasm? And what, they, what, what they're kind of saying is that, hey, you, you're going to have a great idea. And you're going to need to build it. You're going to need to market it. You're going to need to get people excited about it. That's your early adopters. And then what's going to happen is you're going to have to wait it out while you get the mass market to go in on what you've got. You're going to, you're going to have to, you know, it's going to take some time before everybody jumps in. And how long it takes really depends on kind of the strength of your product, depends on the marketing you do, depends on the outreach, depends on how quickly you can connect to an audience, depends on if your early adopters are good evangelists who are going to kind of promote you to people. Are they influencers that are going to get the mass market to, to go? A lot of things can make that crossing the chasm short or long. But regardless, whether it's short or long, you need to have the funding to make it through, to get from point A to point B. And Many, many, many startups have this problem. They come up with a really great idea, but they don't have enough funding to cross the chasm. There's a whole business of kind of what I would call more predatory venture capitalists, predatory banks, who will look at small startups and they will look for places that have a really great idea, but clearly not enough funding. And they'll swoop in and either you know provide funding to survive, usually at the 11th hour when the company's about to die and people will basically give away whatever they need in order to survive. Or they go in and they, they basically pick it up on the cheap. One of the biggest ways they do this is they go to small companies, small uh, startups, and they tell the owner, hey, you're in debt, say a million dollars, two million dollars, because that's what you raised and you're, you're about to run out of money. You're not going to make it. So why don't we give you two and a half million dollars? And you basically do not have to live with debt. You, you basically will pay off your debt. We'll give you a couple hundred thousand as a, hey, you tried kind of, you know, trophy. And, uh, you know, you go off about your way, come up with another good idea, and, and we'll take this stuff off your hand. We'll take the IP off your hands. They then proceed to take that IP out. They bring it in in kind of an incubator type way, or they then find ways to maximize it. And so it's a whole it's a whole way people make money and, and make things work is a, by doing it this way. In comic books, the same exact thing happens. Yeah, this isn't just a business a video about business. This is a video about comics. And in comics, a new comic or a new idea has to cross the chasm before it gets an audience and starts picking up again. If you look at a lot of runs, and particularly a lot of the ones we do the sales analysis for, you see a lot of comics, they come out, they have a artificially high first number, which is, I have argued and will continue to argue, a bad idea. It's disastrous. Because what happens is it sets a false expectation about the ceiling of this book, when really it's purely propped up through incentive programs and variants and other things that have nothing to do with the actual comic and the success that it may or may not have. Then you see the numbers plummet. You see issue two go down, three, four, and you see things kind of fall. And if you've listened to a lot of those videos, you notice that I tend to look at issue six as a good barometer of, all right, is it going to stabilize and start to pick up again, or are we still in kind of a free fall mode? Well, most of the comics that have been put out by Marvel and DC in the last, I, I don't know, um, you know, 10 years, certain last six years, have never stabilized. They basically go into that kind of free fall mode and they keep dropping slower, but they basically keep falling. And the problem is these comics are not, you know, quote unquote, 
crossing the chasm. They're getting that initial audience, they're getting some initial buy-in to the idea, but they're never finding their main audience, and therefore they're never finding any kind of real stability. So what does it take to survive? What does it take to cross a chasm and actually get a book that will, will, will last? Well, it, it takes patience. It takes uh, being able to wait it out. It's, it's just like that question that a lot of uh, bankers and investors will ask small companies. Do you have enough funding to survive, to cross a chasm, to get to the point where you can stabilize? And this is where if comic books were run more like a real business, you'd be looking at every project and every portfolio piece as, hey, let's, uh, let's see. You, you, okay, you want to launch another Batman book. All right, we've got 40 already, but show us your projections. What's going to happen? All right, first issue is going to come out. It's going to sell pretty well, and then it's going to plummet because we aren't going to do variants for issue two. And, uh, and so there will be some jackass in the room and be like, well, what if we did do variants for issue two? And it's like, you shut up. You, you, you're not helping. What's going to happen? And then how long before it takes us to get to our, you know, a sustainable market? Well, the challenge that the U.S. comic industry has right now is that they aren't really thinking about a sustainable market. They're not thinking about issue two, three, four. They're thinking basically about one issue. And then uh, they're thinking about, we'll do another one, and then maybe we'll get to six, and this will be a limited series. We don't ever have to worry about that ongoing series business. But the problem is it's the ongoing series business that ultimately makes a title profitable, gives it some sustainment, provides IP. I mean, right now we're seeing a lot of movies come out. We're seeing a lot of licensing deals come out. But you know the scary part? Almost all of them are from more than 10 years ago. Many of the movies that are getting adapted, the things they're they're coming, the stories and that they're wanting to tap are are old. I saw some speculation about what Spider Man going to do next. It's like, well, we could do something with the Sinister Six, definitely Craven's Last Hunt at one point, and they go down like several other storylines that they could potentially do with Spider Man. None of which, none of which were in the last fifteen years or so. Not a single one from the Dan Slot run. At no point is somebody going, hey, we should uh, put Doc Ock in, uh, in Peter Parker's body and try that for Nobody. At no point is saying, let's make uh, Peter Parker a tech zillionaire and have him run around. Nobody. That doesn't mean they're not going to take little moments and little ideas from those runs. They absolutely will. But most of the ideas are coming from the past. And one reason they're coming from the past is because those comics had ongoing stories. Those comics had Lots, those comics cross the chasm because they, they were patient enough to wait it out, to actually build momentum and build payoff that made the stories that much more impactful, to make the personalities such that you could actually get something more out of it. If you don't ever cross the chasm, if you don't ever create a longer run, the comics are never going to have the momentum to actually give you that, you know, first of all, it won't give you a sustainable audience for the comic. And then you could say, I don't really care about the comic. I just care about the other stuff, the auxiliary stuff, the, you know, the, the ongoing money. Well, you're not going to get that either. Short-term thinking basically ensures you're going to get the early adopters, that first group, and nothing else. And that's what you're seeing over and over. That's why the comic numbers are low. None of them, none of them are going for mass market. They're going for kind of cheap, you know, max out the early adopter run. I mean, here's... Here's the thing that I, I think is potentially, you know, a, a scary fact. What if the early adopter group, the total market, you've, you've, you've heard me talk about the total available market, the TAM. What if the total available market for that early adopter group is about 125,000, 150,000? That's it. If that's the case, number one, that's terrifying. It's a very small early adopter market. That very much is the definition of a niche. But number two... What does it say if the vast majority, like 90% of the comics being put out, are maxing out that, that initial early adopter group and never going any further? What evidence do we have that uh, comics are going to the normies, that they're going to the mainstream? Is there any? Uh, maybe there's not. Is a comic industry right now the early adopter group and that's it? And things like manga and things like Dogman are the ones that are getting into the that quote that that normies group that that bigger portion of the market. If that's true, that's a disaster. Not only is that uh, capping all kinds of things down the road, but potentially that's that uh, you know that that spells a very dangerous situation for any kind of expansion, 
any kind of licensing in the future. And it, it, it's basically an admission that stories that we're reading right now, the stories that are getting made, don't really matter. They don't really matter because if they never, if they never puncture, if they never go outside of the early adopter group and never get into the mass market, you know, they, they don't matter. That's a terrifying place to be. X-Men number one, uh, that uh, the old one, the one that Chris Claremont and Jim Lee won, the one that sold uh, just, just a, tons and tons of comics. What, seven? Was it seven, eight million? Is that what they think? Just a crazy amount of comics. Uh, that clearly went past the early adopter right into the mass market, even the late adopters. It, it, it fully penetrated the market. That is the market size. In the 90s, there were game consoles. There were other distractions. There was movies. There's plenty of other things. Yes, comic was cheaper, and that's definitely a factor. But it just shows that that market is there. More recently, you see that, you know, My Hero Academia, Demon Slayer, Dogman, all these other, these other books, they're selling millions of copies. The market is there. Comics, just not getting to it. How do you get to it? You got to be able to have enough money, have enough patience, have enough time, have enough story to wait it out. The business tends to reward projects that survive, that, that basically stick it out. Spawn, you know, the sales analysis of Spawn is very boring because it, it starts out very strong, made a ton of money for several years, slowly declined, declined down into the 30s, in the 20s to some extent. And then what do you know? Because it just survived, because it kept putting one foot in front of the other, starts going back up again. Obviously, Todd McFarlane, when he was on the title, it sold better than when he wasn't. But you see this arc. The fact that it's got that history and that backbone to build into and to, to leverage and to, you know, to go back, it means that right now, things like King Spawn, Gunslinger Spawn, all those other books are doing really well because it's leveraging its history. Effectively, it crossed the chasm, it found its audience, and now it's able to you know, basically draw on that equity. There's a, there's a worrying position right now for the mainstream comic audience if all the comics are stuck in that first gear. They're stuck in that early adopter and never can go further. That's, that's bad. And if on top of that, the big two publishers are making decisions based on you know, deprioritizing longevity, that's, uh, yeah, again, that's a recipe for this to all go very, very niche and stay niche. It's also a recipe for somebody who does want to sell comics and does want to have a mass market, it's a recipe for that group to make a lot of money. Because I still maintain, the market is there. The audience is there. That mass market will buy these, will buy comics. If you price it right, have the right content, put it out, they absolutely will. You got to get to them. Who's going to get to them? Thanks for listening.